Hello, and good afternoon, everyone. This is Jeff Kitchens from Let's Cure CP. Um, hope you're having a wonderful day, and I appreciate you all attending uh, this webinar series. Um, I would like to pass off the torch to uh, Dr. Michael Kruer. He uh, is going to be presenting today uh, the genetic contr contributions to cerebral palsy. So welcome, Dr. Kruer, and uh, we look forward to learning more about your um, study today. And if anyone has questions, please remember to use the um, the icon. It's the second one from the, uh, from the phone. Just click on that and send the question to me. And at the end of the session, we will have a Q&A session. Thank you very much. All right. Very good. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, to speak with all of you. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to sharing just a little bit of the, the work we're doing uh, on the genetics of uh, cerebral palsy. Um, and uh, also, uh, part of this is going to be uh, a showcase of the, the collaborative network uh, that's building not only across the United States, uh, but across the world in, in support of uh, this, this series of projects. Um, I'd certainly like to thank uh, Let's Cure CP, uh, who made this, uh, this webinar possible. So um, as a little bit of background, uh, I'm a, a pediatric neurologist um, practicing at, at Stanford Children's in uh, Sioux Falls. Uh, I'm also a, a molecular geneticist, and um, my laboratory uh, is studying cerebral palsy. Uh, next slide, please. So I know that this group is uh, no stranger to uh, the concept of, of cerebral palsy, um, but I did want to stress the fact that uh, CP is, is typically thought of as a, a non-progressive disorder, um, although the manifestations of the condition can certainly markedly change over time. Next slide, please. Uh, just a little bit of history, uh, cerebral palsy was uh, a uh, concept that actually arose in the late 1800s. Uh, Little was actually the first to uh, introduce the concept, uh, and he postulated that in cases of CP, um, that it was likely a, a result of the child being, quote, partially suffocated, uh, which, which injures the nervous system. Uh, Osler was, was credited with the origin of the term cerebral palsy, um, but Freud, uh, always controversial, actually was one of the first to uh, dispute that there was uh, a lack of oxygen and blood flow uh, that was the fundamental root of all causes, uh, all cases of CP. Next slide, please. Um, and, and so despite this, uh, it's widely been accepted in, in the medical uh, literature and the, the research community um, that uh, cerebral palsy in most children is the result of uh, impaired blood flow, lack of oxygen, um, at some level, uh, although there, there's starting to be more and more recognition uh, that there might be other contributions uh, to CP. And this is a, an interesting and, and controversial uh, paper that uh, was written by, by Karen Nelson and her collaborator, uh, Jonas Ellenberg. Uh, but one of the statements in this, this article uh, was that current data do not support the belief uh, widely held in the medical and legal communities that much of CP is due to birth asphyxia, um, i.e. lack of oxygen. Next slide, please. Um, so we'll come back to that idea, but in, uh, in terms of introducing the, the research that we're, we're doing, um, for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to be focused on uh, spastic forms of, of CP. Um, but again, there are, CP can come in multiple different, uh, different forms, uh, including uh, dyskinetic and, and ataxic forms. Uh, and of note, uh, all of these forms of, of CP are of interest to our research group. Um, and are the, the topic of active study. Next slide, please. So the um, idea that uh, CP might, uh, in fact, be due in some children uh, not only to problems with blood flow, uh, to perinatal strokes, uh, or to malformations, um, but may, in fact, actually be associated with uh, normal MRI scans. Uh, suggesting that there, there might be something else going on for a proportion of children uh, has really started uh, to gain momentum. Uh, and Dinah Redahau's group 
uh, in Australia, uh, published a paper a few years ago, uh, and this one actually looked at uh, the subset of children who do not have abnormal MRIs, like you can see in the bottom panel here, uh, but in fact have, have normal or, uh, quote, nonspecific uh, findings on the neuroimaging. And their question was whether uh, there could be metabolic disorders that were present in a subset of these children. Uh, in fact, there are uh, some cases of metabolic disorders, uh, but still the vast majority of, of cases of uh, CP um, in the group with, with normal MRI scans of the brain uh, it still remains to be determined. Next slide. So this is an interesting study that came out uh, just earlier this year, uh, and this was a, a Japanese group uh, that actually looked at uh, children that were born at term. So these were, were not preterm children with, uh, with all the, the risks of uh, CP that, that are associated with preterm birth. Uh, and in addition, uh, many of these children, uh, in fact almost half, um, had normal MRI findings. Uh, and this has continued to, to challenge some of the, the ideas um, that have existed in, the, in the, uh, both the research and the, the medical community um, that CP is always caused by uh, problems with, with blood flow. Uh, and this, this actually led these authors to suggest that, quote, uh, there are unknown pathophysiologic processes at work, uh, meaning that there's something else that's causing CP um, in a substantial proportion of children. Um, and at this point in time, it, it's not clear what that is. Next slide, please. So enter genetics, um, and I know that, that everyone has a, a different background, um, but, but just as a starting point, uh, genetics, to, you know, our genes can to some extent be thought of as the, the book of life. Uh, that is the, the blueprint needed to effectively build a human being from scratch. And encoded within our genes um, are the instructions for, uh, you know, building a, a person. Uh, and that can include uh, aspects of a person from the, their height, uh, their uh, hair color, uh, but also um, disease states can be encoded uh, within our genes. And although each of us um, essentially has the, the, the same, uh, have the same genes, um, the spellings of those genes, if you will, uh, can be quite different from person to person. And in particular, if there's more than just a variation, if, if there's a mistake where a portion uh, page of that book, so to speak, has been uh, torn out, or if there are portions of the, the recipe to build a human being uh, that have been smudged, or if there's a misspelling, um, any of those uh, changes in the genetic code can actually lead um, to uh, physical symptoms. And sometimes, uh, can cause the disease in and of itself. Next slide, please. So all of these findings kind of set the stage for the, the question of whether um, in some patients there are single gene uh, problems, misspellings in those, those single genes, uh, for example, that could cause CP in and of themselves. Um, and these would be uh, causes of CP that are, are not related to cortical malformations, uh, they're not related to other genetic syndromes, not related to metabolic disorders, and not related to uh, predispositions to clotting, for example. Uh, next slide. And so the, the first uh, single gene form of CP was actually uh, discovered around eight years ago uh, by a group in Israel who found uh, that in uh, a single family there was uh, a familial uh, inheritance of CP, that multiple family members uh, actually had cerebral palsy. And in this family, they found uh, deletions, uh, so missing genetic instructions, um, in a particular gene called uh, ANKRD15. Um, and this kind of set the stage for the idea that, that some uh, forms of CP actually could be uh, related to problems with a single gene. Next slide. Um, and then please click forward. Uh, there were... This, this uh, work was actually followed up uh, by a series of studies uh, finding uh, similarly that in other patients with CP, uh, there were single gene uh, problems that would lead to a clinical picture compatible with cerebral palsy. Uh, these are children that in general were not born premature. They did not have the typical risk factors. Um, but in many cases, uh, they, they had a familial 
uh, form of CP where multiple members of a single family uh, were affected. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that at the, the end of the, um, the webinar. Uh, but there can be quite a bit of variation in how um, these things show up. And so, for example, even if uh, there's not a family history of uh, cerebral palsy, in some cases, if both parents are, are a carrier, unbeknownst to them, uh, it's possible that, that their child could be affected uh, by CP. Next slide. And so each of these uh, single gene forms of CP uh, were relatively rare uh, diagnoses in and of themselves. These are not uh, common disorders. Uh, and in general have been found in, in just a, a handful of patients at this point in time. Um, interestingly, though, there, there's some overlap uh, here, and we can learn some lessons from other uh, neurodevelopmental disorders. Uh, in particular, uh, if you look at intellectual disability or autism. Uh, forward, please. And in these conditions, uh, you'll see, in fact, that uh, there are probably a multitude of genes that, in fact, uh, combine to lead to a significant burden of disease. So while there might not be one single gene that causes intellectual disability, um, when you combine many of the dozens of causes of, of intellectual disability, um, the combined um, effect of all of the, the genetic uh, forms of the disorder um, end up being quite substantial. And the disorder uh, from that standpoint, is, is no longer rare, but it's, it's a relatively common cause uh, of the disease. Next slide. And so, in fact, um, with some of the advances in genetics, it's been possible to identify um, on an unprecedented level new genetic causes of disease. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and, in fact, this has been done on a large scale uh, for intellectual disability, and it begs the question as to whether, uh, in fact, dozens of CP genes might exist. And also, uh, an important secondary question is, uh, what might the consequences of that be? Uh, for many neurological conditions, we're learning that even though there are distinct roads uh, to get to a given condition, uh, that many of these genes overlap, and the proteins that are encoded by these genes, in fact, interact uh, in a very a living functional way in our cells, and when there are problems with these genes and these proteins, uh, then in fact it can lead to a common clinical picture, um, in this case perhaps CP. Uh, please click ahead. And so my interest in CP actually be began with a single family um, that I had met in the clinic. Uh, this is a young lady who, whose patients graciously uh, allowed me to show the video. Um, she has a, a typical scissor gait um, consistent with uh, a spastic diplegic form of CP, um, and she had gone through multiple surgeries, um, but interestingly, um, she had three siblings, and all of them uh, were more severely affected with uh, spastic quadriparesis. And so there had been debate among all the physicians caring for this family for years as to whether or not all the siblings, in fact, had the same thing. Uh, next slide. So this is just a summary slide, but um, the, the common element here is that all of the, the children um, in this family that were affected, in fact, had CP. Um, their IQs varied. Um, some of them were intellectually uh, disabled. Some of them were not. Uh, one of the children had epilepsy. Uh, but importantly, the, the family structure in this case um, allowed us to uh, take some genetic shortcuts and really learn something valuable. Um, by studying this family who um, eagerly participated in our studies. And I, I think that underlines an important aspect of all of this work, and um, it's that it's only through partnerships between uh, physicians and, and researchers and, and families uh, that really this sort of work is able to move forward. Next slide. And so this is a, a diagram um, of, uh, of the family structure that you can see on the, on the top left. Um, and, in fact, there was a mother and father who are both healthy, um, but yet the dark uh, circles and squares represent affected children. You can see four out of five of their children had a form of CP. Um, their brain MRIs were, were close to normal and, in fact, um, seemed to be normal very early on, and it was only later that very subtle uh, changes were actually detected. Um, as we went on and used more sophisticated MRIs, we actually found that there were differences in the, the connectivity between different brain regions. 
So the way that um, these children's brains were actually wired uh, was different compared to uh, children of, of the same age uh, without cerebral palsy. Next slide. Uh, and so uh, these children had had an extensive workup to try to understand the, the cause of, of their uh, apparently familial uh, CP. Um, but one of the, the upshots of this was that we actually had cells from these patients uh, to support our studies. Next slide. And here's where I'm going to, uh, you know, get into some of the, the nitty-gritty genetics. So uh, forgive me, but um, I, I think this is important to kind of get um, a sense of the, the breadth of the, the work that we're doing at this point in time. So we, we didn't know where the, the causative gene lived, so to speak, um, and we were um, able to narrow it down to a very specific uh, proportion from literally uh, 25,000 genes we were able to narrow it down to a small region of chromosome 10, um, which uh, contained only a, a 100 genes. From that point, we were able to, uh, to use some new cutting-edge genetic uh, technology to narrow it down further. Uh, next, please. And we were actually able to, um, through a series of um, genetic steps, we were able to identify uh, mutations in a, a single gene uh, called gamma adducin that actually uh, seemed to be uh, mutated in all the children that were affected with CP, um, but not found in the children uh, and the parents uh, with, uh, without CP, the child and the parents without CP. And what we found is that when we, we looked across uh, species, we found that this, this particular part of the protein um, encased in the box uh, was critically important and was uh, similar in human beings um, all the way down to much simpler organisms, including uh, zebrafish, uh, any, uh, worms, and flies. And so even these, these simple, simple organisms uh, had a version of this protein, um, and it seemed that, that this particular part of the protein was critically important. When we looked at what that part of the protein was doing, we actually found uh, that this mutation was predicted to affect the way that the protein interacts with other proteins, and it actually should impair the protein's function. Next slide. So what you see here are um, cells, uh, cells grown from the patients on the right-hand side of the screen, and cells grown from uh, typical individuals of the same age, um, so healthy individuals, on the left. And you can see that, that these skin cells uh, are markedly different in appearance. The, the cells from the healthy individuals, uh, they show this, this tapered, elongated shape, um, where the cells from the patients are much more um, oblong and rounded. Furthermore, if, if you look at um, the association of the two proteins, the, the mutated protein was the ADD3 protein in, in red. Um, if you look at the way that that interacts with its partner, the ADD1 protein, you can see that in the controls, the green and the red combine to form this nice yellow overlap where the two proteins are able to interact. Uh, whereas in the patients, uh, the proteins are not able to interact and there's a, a functional impairment of the protein. It's not doing its job. Next slide. And so one of the jobs of this particular protein is to control the actin cables throughout the cell that actually allow the cell to stretch out and elongate um, and form those more tapered structures. And uh, this is very important for brain cells because uh, in order for brain cells to interact with one another, there has to be a very finely tuned control of the way that the cells will reach out and connect with other cells. And uh, what we did is we looked at this biochemically, and we found that uh, in the patients, there was this uncontrolled growth of these cables, these filaments, um, whereas in a typical, uh, normal, healthy um, set of individuals, uh, this uh, cable growth was, in fact, much more controlled. Next slide. And what we then went on to look at was a fruit fly model. Um, and although uh, I've been killing fruit flies in my kitchen for a couple of weeks now, um, they actually serve as a, an incredibly useful model organism. Uh, so partnering up with um, Doris Kretschmar, uh, a fruit fly researcher, we actually uh, knocked out the um, gene in the fruit fly 
and we're able to show that uh, there were abnormalities in the brains of those, those fruit flies, which you can see in, in panel C and D. Um, perhaps even more importantly, when we looked at the ability of those fruit flies to move, uh, we found that the fruit flies that, were, that lost the adducin uh, gene uh, were not able to walk um, as compared to the normal flies. And so in this uh, simple fruit fly model, we were able to reproduce the human phenotype. That is, the, the human CP um, was actually mirrored in the fruit fly, suggesting that this could be a, a valuable model organism. Next slide. And so this led us um, to look further at, at what might be going on here. Um, the other uh, gene that I mentioned, uh, CANK1, um, in fact, also controls uh, actin filament length, those, those cables in the cell. And so it, it seems that um, at some level, uh, some of these single gene causes of cerebral palsy are actually overlapping. It, and it's pointing to a role in the growth of these actin filaments um, in the normal function of, uh, of brain cells. Next slide. And so lots of these uh, proteins could potentially be sufficient in and of itself to affect the way that brain cells um, are able to interact and uh, could lead to um, a form of cerebral palsy. So from this, we, this uh, initial work, we, we found um, that we, we had discovered a new cause of inherited cerebral palsy. Uh, mutations in this ADD3 gene. Um, this actually uh, uh, led us to some, some new ideas, which I'm going to be talking about in a moment. Um, in addition, uh, these findings suggested that not only are, are these isolated rare causes of CP, um, but in fact the, these CP genes might interact in a, in a functional way um, inside the cells in, and uh, might tell us something very important about uh, what's working or um, perhaps more accurately, what's not working in these cells that leads to CP um, in the children. Um, finally, uh, we know that many more uh, causes of, uh, of cerebral palsy um, likely exist and uh, still await discovery. Next slide, please. So um, as I hinted at, this certainly leads to quite a few more questions. Next slide. Um, and so one of the things that we did was we, we now had some insight into the molecular mechanism, uh, what, what was actually triggering um, the defects that we were seeing in the patient cells. And we asked the, the corollary question, uh, could we do anything about this? Is there anything we could do to uh, restore the function of these cells? And what you can see on the graph is that when we, in fact, treated these cells, uh, these patient cells that were um, showing this uncontrolled growth of the cables um, without any treatment with a compound derived from a, a sea sponge that um, in the laboratory we were able to rescue um, that defect in the control of the actin filaments and restore them to a wild type level. So at least in the dish, uh, we were able to uh, rescue the, the biochemical and molecular um, defect that we were seeing in the cells. Next slide. So this, this is all well and good, um, but one of the, the uh, important questions is, can the brain actually be rewired? Um, you know, it, it's great to do these things with cells in a dish, but how does this actually translate into a, a living uh, human brain? Um, and I think that this is still an unresolved question. Um, but in fact, if, if you look uh, at uh, other examples from other disorders, um, the connections between the different parts of the brain um, in living um, individuals actually can change. And so these are not static things. These are, these are dynamic connections between regions of the brain um, that can be changed by things as simple as medication. Um, so to some extent, yes, the brain can be rewired. Next slide. Um, we've continued uh, to use the um, animal model uh, that I had mentioned. And um, in the flies, uh, we've actually started uh, treating the flies lacking adducin uh, with this compound that we used uh, to rescue um, the phenotype in the dish. And in fact, 
um, although these, these studies are just at their, their very beginning stages, uh, you can see when you compare the untreated mutant flies on the left to the treated flies that the abnormalities of parts of the brain, this is the, the lamina, of the fr uh, fly brain, in fact uh, can be restored to near normal um, by this treatment. And so uh, the next stage is to see what effect this has on the fly's ability to walk. Next slide. So flies can be a, a very valuable model, but all, uh, obviously they're a, a long cry from, um, from a human being. Um, we're also moving forward with uh, patient-based cell models. As I mentioned, we had those, those skin cells that we were able to use so effectively in our early experiments. Uh, one of the, the newer techniques um, that's become available um, you know, across the scientific community is the ability to generate stem cells uh, from skin cells and, and sometimes from other cell types as well. Uh, but these skin cells can be turned into stem cells, which can then be differentiated into neurons. So we can go from skin cell to stem cell to brain cell, um, all in a dish, and have a model um, in the laboratory um, of these single gene forms of CP. And so uh, one of the um, effects of our continued studies is that we hope to be able to develop several models of um, inherited cerebral palsy that we can look at side by side to see where there are common features and where there are important differences. And this will be crucial in allowing us to develop uh, new therapies. Next slide. So I, I wanted not only to, to talk about our, um, our research studies to date, uh, which are, are certainly um, continuing in earnest, uh, but also use this time as a, as a bit of a call to action, um, because as I mentioned, uh, all of this work is only possible um, through collaborations with families. And um, my laboratory at Sanford Children's uh, has reached out to laboratories, as you can see, across the country um, and across the world, um, and also partnered with um, some uh, notable physicians uh, in the CP community. Uh, you can see here several of us uh, at the American Academy of Cerebral Palsy and Developmental Medicine. Um, this group has been uh, instrumental in uh, giving us the, the um, funds needed to, to accomplish the early part of our goals. Um, and I'm also pleased to say that uh, we're moving ahead with a um, partnership with AI Biotech, um, who will also uh, greatly facilitate this work um, through their, their gracious support um, via next-generation sequencing studies. Uh, next slide, please. But uh, the, what we're envisioning and, and what's actively uh, being pursued is kind of a, a multi-step process. It's a, a collaborative um, effort through multiple institutions, and we're looking for 100 a, a patients with CP, where we've enrolled uh, perhaps um, half that many so far. Uh, but we're looking for, for patients with CP uh, without an obvious cause. So we're, we're looking for, for patients that, that don't have a, um, a malformation as, as the cause of their CP. Um, they, they don't have an apparent stroke as the cause for, for their CP um, because most likely there are going to be several different uh, causes of, of cerebral palsy that are identified. Um, and in order to focus on the subset of, of uh, kids and adults who have genetic causes for their CP, um, we've, we've taken this approach. Uh, but the idea is to take this, this group of 100 patients, uh, collect samples from them just through a, a mouth swab, and then uh, through a series of, of uh, sequencing uh, of their DNA, uh, we'll be able to uh, determine quite a bit about genetic contributions to cerebral palsy. Next slide. Um, those who are interested in participating um, this is all facilitated through a, a central institutional um, review board. And so uh, any cl clinician, uh, any physician who cares for um, uh, a child or adult with CP um, or that, that individual's family um, or the individual him or herself uh, can contact us. Um, we have study flyers that we share. Um, and then we connect you with our study coordinator, uh, typically through phone and email. Uh, everything is explained, and from that point, um, a kit is sent to a family's home. This is a uh, cheek swab kit, so it's, it's a lot easier than um, a blood draw. 
This is simply rubbed on the inside of the cheek, dropped in the, the mail, and uh, sent back to our group. Uh, where at Stanford Research, we have the ability um, through uh, automatic uh, robotic and uh, sample uh, handling system to easily extract the DNA um, and to uh, ultimately sequence uh, that DNA, uh, looking for inherited causes of CP. Next slide. So as I mentioned, um, these studies really can only move forward through partnerships. And so anyone who's interested is, is certainly um, invited to contact, uh, contact us um, at crewerlab at stanfordhealth.org. Um, our, our hope is that through these studies, um, we'll be able to capture a much better snapshot um, of genetic causes of cerebral palsy. Um, we think this is important for, for understanding uh, the fundamental causes of the condition. Um, and we also think that uh, this has important implications for developing therapies. Because as you saw, uh, once we understand more about the biochemistry and more about the genetics of, of what's truly driving the motor dysfunction um, in these patients with, with uh, genetic causes for their CP, um, in some cases that, that can suggest um, new therapies uh, with, uh, with potentially very exciting outcomes. So um, this work would, uh, would not be possible without our, our many collaborators um, and without our um, funding partners who supported this work in its early stages. Um, in particular, I want to thank Doris Kretschmark for her excellent uh, assistance with the Drosophila, the fly studies. Um, and next slide. And uh, this, this work has really um, been uh, enabled in a completely new way um, by all of these uh, valued collaborators. These are our colleagues and friends um, who uh, typically clinicians who care for patients with, with CP um, and, and individuals from the community who have supported this work in its early stages and who are helping to, um, you know, bring this collaboration to the next level. Next slide, please. So here's a, a picture of our lab group uh, here right now. And um, with that, I, I'd like to thank you all for your attention, and I, I'd be delighted to take any questions you might have. Okay, I have quite a few questions coming in. So if anybody else does have questions, please uh, remember to click on the talk icon and uh, send them to me. Um, again, this is Jeff Kitchens with Let's Cure CP. And uh, the questions will be directed to Dr. Michael Kruer. And uh, the first question we have is from viewer number six. Could the absence of the genes be a cause for prematurity that leads to CP? Yes. Yes. That, that's a fascinating question. Um, and it, it's something that uh, at this point in time, uh, you know, be, because we only have so much manpower and so, uh, so many resources, we're not focusing on um, at this point in time. But I think that, that yes, uh, over time, more will be understood um, about the contributors to preterm birth, and genetics will, will certainly play a role. Okay. Viewer 5 has a question. It is, does this potentially affect melanation? Yeah, so that's actually a question that we're, we're very interested in. It, at this point in time, uh, you know, based on the, the MRI scans in our patients and, and based on the, the work we've done in the lab, um, we have not been able to uh, distinguish between physical connections between brain cells and the, the degree of myelination, that is the, the insulation uh, that covers the, those critical connections. Um, some of the, the current studies that we're doing, uh, moving ahead to, to mouse models of the, the condition, um, will help us to, to answer those sorts of questions. So, uh, so stay tuned. Viewer 29 uh, has a question, can we get a recap on identified CP genes or genes that are thought to interact and lead to the presentation of CP? Yes. Uh, so at, at this point in time, uh, there are four genes uh, that actually lead to um, single gene forms of, of CP that encode a protein called AP4, or adapter protein 4. And that adapter protein has four subunits, and mutations in any of those subunits 
have been shown to lead to CP. Um, the other gene that's been shown to be affected is the, the CANK1 gene uh, that's uh, responsible for actin capping. Um, and then the last gene that, that's been definitively identified is this ADD3 gene um, that my group recently published. Um, I think that we're just scratching the surface, as I mentioned. Um, and in fact, uh, outside of this particular project that I, I shared with all of you, um, my group is, is actively engaged in um, studies looking for uh, completely novel uh, genes that, that in and of themselves cause CP. Um, and we, we think we're, we're hot on the trail of others, um, including one, one gene that, uh, that seems to cause um, uh, periventricular uh, cystic uh, leukomalacia, uh, but in, potentially in, in term children. And so uh, I, I think that there's a, there's a lot more uh, to, be, to be looked at. And, um, and so um, you know, we're, we're really hoping to, to start to continue digging into this um, in the near future. Perfect. Now, uh, viewer 29 also asked to clarify, uh, you only want participants who have died, who have a diagnosis of CP without a known or obvious cause? So, yeah, that, that is a little bit confusing. Um, for this particular study that I was highlighting with the, the 100 patients, that's the focus of that study. Um, as I mentioned, my, my group is interested in, in a number of different, different causes of CP. Um, so there, there are other studies uh, that patients and families might be eligible for. In general, we're not focusing um, on cases where a, a known um, cause of the CP has been identified. So there, there um, has been and continues to be outstanding work being done um, on the role of inflammation, on the role of blood flow um, and clotting uh, in, uh, in leading to cerebral palsy. Um, but our group is focused on, on a, a slightly different um, approach. And so we, we are focusing on um, those cases of CP that, um, that might have other causes. Okay. Well, this question, uh, the next couple of questions kind of tie in. So what about uh, patients that do have an injury on the MRI, but they're present uh, differently than what the MRI shows? So that there's a difference between what the MRI shows. For example, children that should be on HEMA but uh, present as quad. Could there potentially be another underlying genetic reason in addition to the injury? Um, th there could be. There could be. I, I think the story is, is probably more complicated um, than all of us have, have thought in the past. Um, and in general, if, if there's anyone out there um, who, who has an interest in this research, I'd, I'd encourage you to, um, to talk to, contact our, our research coordinator. Um, her and I work very closely on an individual basis um, with patients and families who, who might be interested in, in participating. Um, even if they're not sure they can, they, they're able to participate, we're able to walk through that, um, that process uh, with them. So uh, when in doubt, please, uh, please contact us. Okay, we have a local friend whose neuro will not say that the child has CP because there is no evidence in MRI. Despite loads of genetic testing, which has led to nothing else, and he presents with spastic diplegia, could he participate? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, that, that's that's uh, just the sort of the sort of um, individual that, that we're looking to, to help shed some light um, into the the cause of their their symptoms. And then we have one other question: Do patients identified with the MTHFR? Uh, deficient have anything to contribute to the study? Um, perhaps, uh, and, and that would be considered on an individual basis. Um, so if, if you, again, have any questions or um, are interested in the studies, please, uh, please err on the side of contacting us, and um, we'd, we'd be happy to, uh, to discuss it further with you. And is there any cost to anyone that's uh, a potential uh, that wants to participate in the study, is there any cost to them? Great question. Thank you. Thank you for asking it. Uh, no, all of the costs uh, for the research are, are borne by our research group, um, so there, there's no costs to participants. Perfect. Oh, just got another one come in. Do the participants receive any information from the study? Very good question also. Um, 
It depends. If the participants want to receive information, um, they have that option. And, and as part of our informed consent process, um, parents and, and, uh, and, and patients have the ability to um, determine ahead of time if they would like more information, if we do uh, find something that we think uh, sheds some light on the cause of, of uh, their CP. Um, now, with that said, not everyone feels the same way. And so um, people that uh, are not inclined to get that information back but just want to participate in the research are, are welcome to do so, um, whereas those who, who would like that information, um, that, that can be uh, returned uh, to participants. Perfect. Well, Viewer 29 also wanted to thank you for taking the time to do, to do this, and it's absolutely incredible. And I would like to thank you as well, and I'd like to thank everybody that was able to join in on the call. Uh, we will be posting this on our website at uh, curecp.org, C-U-R-E-C-P.org. Uh, so if you missed it or you want to share it with friends or family or anybody uh, in the CP community, please do so. Uh, you'll also be able to find it on our Facebook page. Um, I did just get another question in. Um, so I'll go ahead and cover that, and then we'll end the call with that. If you have any other questions, please feel free to email me uh, at jeff at letscurecp.org. That's J-E-F-F -F at L-E-T-S-C-U-R-E-C-P.org, and I will make sure uh, that we get these questions answered for you. Um, the next question is, there are families outside the country that the type you are looking for, can they participate in the study, or is it only for the U.S.? No, ab absolutely they can participate. Um, in, in fact, um, t two of our, our biggest partnerships are, are with folks in Australia and Japan. Um, and so uh, our informed consent process uh, can be applied to, to folks outside the, the United States. Um, and uh, if, if they're interested, we, we'd welcome their participation. Well, I hope that answers everybody's questions. Uh, Viewer 12 also wants to thank you for the great work. We appreciate you uh, taking the time to do this web series with us and uh, look forward to hearing updates in the future about the, about the study. So thank you, everybody, for participating. And, again, if you have any questions at all, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Have a great day. Thank you so much, everyone, for the opportunity to, uh, to speak to all of you. Take care.